here this morning. If you would stand, greet those around you. You can even cross-pollinate if you'd like. And uh, tell someone you, you're glad to see them this morning. Introduce yourself to someone that you, you may not know and join with us as we worship this morning.
every tongue confess your name. Sing that again. You're holy and eternal. You're holy and eternal. And forever you tongue confess your name that we do bring you a song of praise. We bring you a song of worship. Only you are worthy, God, now and forevermore. Only you will ever be worthy. There is no one like you and there's none besides you. praise this morning. He's worthy of our song. He's worthy of our attention and our focus. He's worthy of more than just a melody or just a, a pretty tune. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our song. from Florida, who's going to lead us in a song. And this is Gabby, she's Zach's wife, and she leads worship in Florida. So she's come this morning, I just think it's neat, we've been talking a lot about the sound and releasing our sound, so she's coming to add her sound to ours. So I just encourage you to worship with us as we sing this next song. Give 
kora shata ha patro monkonda yera brorete ke romo mola la papata to shito moku brera baka baba baba shata da prike ha urodno rochela da mondo abakara rete he sheto makanda and the lord would say i'm building new foundations for you to go higher in and as you press into what i'm saying in this hour the lord says your vision will go over the issues that are blinding you in this season open your hearts for the lord said i'm about to give you vision to see what god has promised you what the lord has promised you on the other side of the trial that you're going through right now i just want you to receive that because i kept as he was prophesying in tongues I kept seeing this thing of getting above the forest because you couldn't see through the forest. And some of you are in a place right now and you don't see yourself coming through. I'm telling you God is building you a foundation that's going to elevate you as we humble ourselves in his side and he lifts us up. And you're going to see what is promised for you on the other side. And that's going to give you the energy and the strength to go through this season and to make it to the other side. So I prophesy to you, you're going over. I speak to every river, every blockage, every issue, every hindrance, and I say you are no obstacle to the Lord. For the Lord is greater than that, and he can carry his people through. And I say that even over our city and over this place that we're going to see into the future. And we're going to see that no matter what it looks like this present darkness does not dictate the light that we will see in the coming days. And so Father, we just agree with that. We receive that today and we go higher in you right now, Lord, to see beyond where we are right now. As he was speaking that as Roger was giving that tongue, I, I heard the Lord say, "Quit looking in your rearview mirror." Lord says I'm giving you a sky view. I'm giving you an elevated view. I'm giving you the view that eagles have when they soar above the storms. So the, so I just hear the Lord saying, it's time to quit looking back and start looking from the place that God is raising you up to. Just put your wings out this morning and just catch the wind. There's a wind blowing across this land. So catch the wind and arise with me and look above. Look with your sky view and take down the rear view.
time they've been singing this, I've been um, hearing, and of course this is so familiar to all of us, this scripture in Ezekiel about the dry bones. And I just feel like I heard the Lord say, the dust that's in the air is not from the Sahara Desert. The dust that's in the air is from the dried bones. So I feel like the Lord's saying that we must pause and prophesy to these bones. So we just speak to the bones. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, these bones, surely, Lord, you will cause breath to enter into them, and they shall live. The visions that you planted in this land from the past, they shall live again. Thus says the Lord, I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am Lord. So we prophesy, as the Lord says here, to the breath. We prophesy and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. Thank you, Lord. You said you would open the graves, Lord, and you would, ca you would cause this, this breath to come, and, the, and the, these graves would open, and you would cause your people to rise up, and they would become a mighty army in this whole region. So, Lord, we thank you today for bringing to our attention, Lord, that we are to prophesy to these bones. We're to prophesy to this dust. We're to call from the, for the winds to come. And, Lord, we even speak it over each other this morning. We prophesy to ourselves, and we say, dry bones, live. Live again in the name of Jesus. We just declare this week as Resurrection Week. I just believe by Friday night we're going to see some things in the Spirit. Things that have been dead, the things that have been hopeless. And I want you to just have a, a, a week of just, I don't know, posture yourself, prepare yourself. And just be having an expectancy that this is a week of resurrection. So Lord, I just speak the resurrection power. That, that, Lord, you died for. Lord, the things that we're believing for is what you died for. And, Lord, we're not believing outside the realm of possibility in you, but we're believing for the manifestation of what you died for. And we decree that over our house, over our city, over our lives, over our region, in Jesus' name. So just to add to that, you know, we're going Friday, and we're going to the Gold Dome, and we're going to act on a word that the prophet gave us and I just keep seeing it as a military mission and I keep seeing it as we've been given an assignment as a house and as a body and we're going and we're, we're going to act on it we're going to release our sound and we're going to add our sound to the sounds that have gone before us the sounds that will come after us and the sounds that are continually flowing between heaven and earth that sound that is constantly going we're going to add our peace to that puzzle, and we're going to fulfill our mission. We're going to follow our leader, and we're going to fulfill our mission. So there's power in that sound, and we've talked about that a lot here in this house. There's power in our voice. There's power in what we release. And, you know, I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes that doesn't all make sense to my physical brain. But you know what? If you talk to the people that surrounded the walls of Jericho, they can tell you that it's true, that the, that, that sound makes a difference in the atmosphere, and it can bring the walls down. I'll tell you two things, that is there's power in the sound and there's power in obedience. When you do what the Lord tells you to do, whether or not it makes sense to your brain, there's power in it. So this morning, we're going to sing about that, and it's a new song, but we're going to sing about that principle. And there's actually a word in Hebrew, that praise, it's, it's yada, but one of the sub-meanings of yada is, is to shoot, as in to shoot an arrow. It's the same word that means praise and the same word that means a weapon. It's literally the same word. And so as we release our praise this morning, as we release our praise Friday night in that, in that place, it's literally a weapon that is effective and that is strong. So God, we just agree with that this morning. Yeah. We just lift our voice this morning and we just declare that we want to partner with you in that. We want to release our sound and everything that you put inside us for this appointed hour and this appointed time and appointed place. Lord, we will obey the word of the Lord and we will walk out what you have set before us and what you have instructed us to walk out because we know there is power in our voice and power in the sound. So this morning we release that.
Hallelujah. Yeah, so we're going to sing this song. We're going to sing about this principle that there is power in what we release. I just encourage you to jump in and sing about this.
over our city, over our region, over the nation.
Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And who is this King of glory? He is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And that's what we're asking for. And we want him to come in his glory. Not so much the Lord of hosts, which means that the people didn't want him. But we want him. So we lift up our hearts, our gates. We lift up the city gates. We lift up this nation before you, Lord. And we invite the King of glory to come. You are the King of glory. The question is answered. You alone. And Lord, this week, this season of our lives, we prepare ourselves to see the manifest glory of God in every area of our lives, Father, in our community, in our purpose. That as you come in, Lord, all will know that you are King. And Lord, they'll have their mouths shut because of the power of the King has come. And we welcome you into this place. We welcome you into our lives like never before. Prepare us, Lord, for this season. Thank you for the breakthrough. Thank you that we're about to see something that we never thought we might see. And it's to your glory. And it's to your honor because you are that king that deserves all the glory and all the praise. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, the Lord's coming into your gates, all right? Prophesy it to him. He's coming in. <laughs> all right. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Roger, you want to say anything about the dome? Do y'all want to say anything? Enough. Say something. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Everybody know Friday night, um, we're going to actually check roll Friday night to see if you're there. And um, I want to make sure you, if you're not there, you must have a note from your parents. <laughs> and uh, no Wednesday night service, so we're giving you breaks so you can sleep and all that. But uh, 7 o'clock, uh, if you could... You probably need to get there a little early. Uh, parking's a little bit strange at the Gold Dome at St. Mary. If you, everybody knows where that is, right? It's a big Gold Dome <laughs> on the King's Highway. Uh, on the King's Highway, that's good. And um, uh, Chuck Pierce and his team will be with us as well as our team, our worship team. And Chuck, this weekend at his conference, uh, broke out of the conference several times, you said. I wasn't watching the conference and talked to the importance of this meeting. And I invited everybody from all the, the states to come. <laughs> so we may have some more people than we think we do. Um, so that's okay. That's good because um, we, we need it. And we need the people there that are going to make that sound that we just sang about to fulfill the prophetic word. That's in Second Chronicles 20 when it talks about when the prophet tells them how to worship to break the siege that would come against them. And the prophet Jehoshaphat says, we will, we're going to honor the prophets and we're going to do what they say. And that's what we're doing here. And just sending the worship forth. And we'll talk a little bit about what that's about here in a little bit. But that's at 7 o'clock. And please tell somebody, invite somebody to that as well. Okay, Karen, come. Uh, this, this will be a good follow-up because right after the conference, we're having our children's kids camp. Yes. If we still have room, if anybody wants to sign up your kids or anybody that you know, but really we need to know now. I never want to turn a child away. Uh, we're so excited. It's going to be a great camp, uh, but we need to know ASAP. So um, for, all the, for all of you who have registered your kids, we need your registration forms filled out, and um, we have them in the back. Please do that today. We need that. And if you um, have a child and they're bringing a friend to camp, then we need um, – that child's parents has to fill out this registration form. And um, can you think of anything else, Jocelyn? 
Yeah, okay, we just need those filled out. Can I share something that I saw in worship? Sure, okay. So uh, when we were worshiping, um, I saw, like, people that, um, that, like, they were struggling, and some were just, like, standing in the dark. And they, um, it reminded me of, um, like, when Jesus said, we're going to go over to the other side. Uh, and um, I saw people, and, like, they knew there was another side with things that you're dealing with in your life, but you just couldn't see it. And you were trying to reason, and you were trying to figure it out. But I felt this in our city, too. It's part of this dome thing. And, um, but when the worship, when the worship came, it was like it, it's the worship is what's going to get you from here to here. I saw it so clear. I wish I could explain the vision, but I won't go into it. But um, it's, it's where you just have to come into a place, and that's what we were really hitting there as we were in unity. It's to where things just, you don't have to make sense out of everything anymore because that holds you back. And that's what we were praying in prayer this morning, just that God would deal with the things in our heart, not just our heart, but in the hearts of the people in our city. Everything that's been holding us back from truly worshiping God in spirit and truth. And anywhere we've worshiped other gods, even just things in our life where we're giving more adoration, more affection, more time. That's like worshiping, giving him, giving those things more attention than our holy, true, living God. So we've been repenting of that. But as we were in here, I just saw that. I saw where people were just going, I'm not going to make sense of my situation anymore. I'm not even going to worry right now. I'm going to get my eyes on God. And part of the warfare is just focusing upon him and worshiping. And it'll take you from here to there, and you'll just be to the other side. And that's when she started singing that song about how our worship is like arrows. And um, it's like a weapon in our hand. And it's, and it's like an arrow. When we worship, it goes, and it will hit the mark. And that's us, like when you're on this side, wherever you are in your situation, and you worship, you're, it's, it's that arrow, and you're just going to go, and you're gonna, it's going to transport you to where you need to be in that breakthrough with the Lord. Anyway, that's it. Let's take that word. All right, that's a good word. You know, before we let our kids go, I want to also, uh, Carrie reminded me, our Go Girls are leaving when? What's the date? All of August. So we get them back later, but we're going to lose them for a little while. So uh, we need volunteers for the nursery. Uh, if you don't volunteer, we'll volunteer you for it. All right? So, okay. Now we have a women's retreat now. Uh, we're going to, Kelly Beard had a vision of us having a women's retreat. So we're trying to plan it, but we need to know who all's interested. There's a sign-up sheet so we know how big a place to get, to know how much it's going to cost. Uh, Miss Charlotte Mershbach has agreed to come to it and be our um, do our ministry time that we're going to have, but it'll be some fun time planned and relaxing, refreshing time. And it's the weekend of October 4th through the 6th. It'll be a Thursday night, Friday, and Saturday, and we'll come home Saturday night. So, ladies, if you're interested in going, please sign up on the sheet uh, right out by the door so we kind of get an idea of how big of a place we need to find for everybody. Thanks. And raise, you're finding the place, aren't you? In the woods with tents and everything. That's good. All right. So, <laughs> no, it'll be a nice place, I was told. All right. Well, it'll be a nice tent. You know, they, ha they, they have air mattresses now. But anyway, not a men's retreat. Okay. <laughs> Vanessa will shoot the deer, everything. It'll be great. It'll be great. Okay. No, we're just teasing. All right, we're going to release our children, ages 6 to 12. We'll let you guys go. Bless you as you go to your ministries. Oh, volunteers for the children's ministry uh, will be 6 o'clock tonight. Okay, I think we've covered everything. All right. I really feel like that. last week we spoke a word about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you weren't here, uh, I'd encourage you to watch it again and uh, take the prayer at the end when we prayed for everybody. And today we want to follow up. John and I are going to kind of tag team here on something of why we need the supernatural. What the baptism of the Holy Spirit was about was an infeeling. But then what do we do when we're in, we have this infeeling of the Holy Spirit? Why does God want us to function in the supernatural? And because uh, I really believe this weekend, this Friday night, is going to break something in the city. Because our city was known for the supernatural. 
And that was what, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, I mean, Shreveport was known all around the world for the supernatural. And we'll tap into that theologically why that is. But we really want to go after that um, in, in a season like we never have before. And uh, Scott and I were joking, Camilla at home, is she home? She's watching World Cup. Okay. No. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> no, but she's home. Uh, she's pregnant. And she, you know, and I felt like we talked about, you know, a belly is kind of like a dome, you know. And uh, I felt like when this, <laughs> all the ladies just shook their head. Oh, my God, he didn't just say that, did he? But, but it, it is, in a sense, in that um, some of the guys still got a dome. But anyway, <laughs> but this, the, the prophetic word is it's going to crack. And, you know, when that water breaks and that life comes forward, I really feel like that's what's going to happen this weekend. It's like God's going to break something. Our water's going to break, and we're going to burst something like we never have before. And I just want to build on that today. So just kind of want to pick up where we left off last week and just add to that the need for the supernatural because that's really what the baptism of the Holy Spirit's about. It's not just so that you can talk in tongues or you can have the gift of healing or whatever, uh, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. It is so that the supernatural will be a normal part of your life. Uh, it will be natural for you to walk in the supernatural. You should have every day these wild coincidences that happen every day. You know, it's like, okay, well, that's crazy. That was weird. That was weird. You can't make this stuff up. That should be your statement every day and uh, at least every other day. <laughs> and, that, and that's the way we believe in living. And I want to encourage you today. I want to impart that to you today. And we'll pray at the end that that will happen to you. In the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the story, you know the story, 1 and 2, when the fire came from heaven and the, the tongues came down, they had this experience, and now it's moved. The Jewish church is on fire for the Lord, even so much so now that it's spread to the Gentile church. Even Peter and them didn't even know it had spread. That's the kind of revival you want. I had a guy, uh, we support his ministry in India, his name is Victor John, and uh, he had planted over 2,000 churches and. He was being supported by the Southern Baptists, and they thought he was lying. And uh, so they came to, they were thinking about taking their funding away from him because they thought he was making up the numbers. And so they, they went, they came to India, and they went out in the villages and said that one by they were going to count all the churches to see if he was lying. And uh, so when they came back, they came back weeping, and they repented to him. They said, Brother, we're sorry. We, we even thought you were lying. As a matter of fact, not only do you not only have 2,000, though, you got 4,000 because others had multiplied and he didn't even know about it because this church broke off this church and broke off this church. And see, that's what we want to see. We want to see when you touch somebody, it touches somebody else and it touches somebody else. And you have no idea. And you're going to come to heaven one day and say, somebody's going to say, you saved my life. And they go, well, I didn't even know you. Yeah, but you touched this person and they touched me. You understand what I'm saying? That's the exponential power of the supernatural when it starts doing that. So the Gentiles were being whacked by the Lord, and Peter walks in the room and hears them talking in tongues and goes, what's going on here? <laughs> How'd these people get it? They hadn't even been baptized in water yet, and yet they're already talking in tongues and having the gifts of the Spirit. So the gospel had already spread, and that's part of the gospel is the supernatural, that it begins to spread that way. And so now the church is, is having this encounter in the early church and get this, there's no battles or no descriptions, uh, 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 anybody fighting the fact of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They, there were no denominations yet. Isn't that cool? That, that everybody was being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was a basic, ABC. You get saved, you get water baptized, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. And now we get saved, maybe. Then we argue on how you get baptized. Then we don't even believe, some don't even believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What's going to break that? Supernatural will. Because the supernatural will demonstrate what it's all about. And when, let me tell you, when somebody gets whacked by the Holy Spirit and God's done, somebody knows something happened to your life. I love when we tell those testimonies about that. Um, I heard uh, Mario Marilla was telling a testimony the other day of a guy who gave a prophetic word for, I don't even know if he believed in healing, he had leukemia, and he gave him a word. He said, you got leukemia in your body, and God said, you're being healed right now. So the guy went to the doctor and said, I was at a meeting. This man told me I don't have leukemia anymore. I need you to tell me if I do or don't. 
and they had to do a bone marrow, uh, to take bone marrow from me, which is a very painful experience. And they went through the excruciating pain to pull out some of his bone marrow, and they told him, you no longer have any leukemia in your body. Now, that's the type of supernatural that defied everything. And think about the medical facility there that had to witness that testimony. Had to, had, to, had to walk through that whole thing and say, wow, this guy said this and this happened. So guess what? There's no denying that. Our friend Regis Richard, y'all know uh, who's ministered here from California, uh, his wife was having a baby down in Mansfield, and uh, they did the epidural, and it went the wrong way and went to her brain, and she died, and the babies died. There was no heartbeat, no heartbeat in her, and Regis was in the room, and you know Regis, he's, he's, he's pretty, he started screaming in tongues, and he grabbed his wife's feet and said, you will live and not die. And he began to, and they stood, the nurses started to say, sir, you can't scream like that. He says, I can do whatever I want. This is my wife. She's going to live, and she's not going to die. And he began to prophesy right there while they're trying to revive her. And while he's praying, her heartbeat comes back, and the baby's heartbeat comes back, all right? So much so that the news, when they went to the doctor, the, the local Channel 3 News went and did a whole story about it. And they asked the doctor, what do you think happened? He says, I have no explanation. He said, other than it was a miracle. Now, that's what we want. We need to transform that. That hit the headlines, hit television all through Mansfield. So they hit it here too because it came all the way here. That's what we're talking about. So when Jesus was about to ascend to heaven, he, he talks to the, he, the whole time while he's in the 40 days prior to the, the last 10 days while they're waiting in the upper room, he's talking about the restoration of the kingdom of, of God. And one of the things he's talking about in the restoration of the kingdom of God is that his people function as God does. Thanks, John. Thank you for saying amen. All right? That we are to function like he does. And that's what he was asking for the restoration. And what were the disciples asking for? The restoration of Israel. Okay? And he said, look, that's not your issue right now. God will take care of that. Your issue is to manifest the kingdom of God. And he tells them in verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts, he says to them, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it's going to come on you with power. He didn't say you're just going to get the Holy Spirit so you can have this nice little encounter. He says it's coming with power. The word is dunamis which means by force, it means miraculous power with ability and abundance and to become a worker of miracles. So when you asked for the Holy Spirit, did you ask for all that? Yes, you did, whether you knew it or not. Jehovah's Sneaky gets that into you where you just think, oh, well, this Holy Spirit, I'll take that, and you get it. But what you don't understand you got is you got the ability to be a worker of miracles. And to begin to do that. So in the power, that word, one of the words, uh, definition is also violence. And you're able to do it with power, with a violent power. So much so that you invade the spirit of darkness with violence. And you begin to take back what belongs to the Lord. And then he says that you'll become witnesses. The Greek word there, martus, means a martyr. In other words, you're, a, you're dead to yourself and alive to become a miracle worker. That's what you're called to be when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And boy, don't we need that in the church today? Look how much church can go on without the supernatural. I mean, we've learned how to function without any miracles in meetings. We've learned how to function in life without believing for miracles. And when they happen, it's like, wow, where'd that come from? Instead of there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, and we just begin to see this is normal, this is normal. So when Jesus was saying the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to give us the super, supernatural ability to become miraculous workers and that we would have a martyr, martyr lifestyle, we'd be dead to what we want to do and alive to him living in us and living through us wherever we are. We should have that hunger everywhere we go. Settling for anything less is to deny the purpose and the power of the cross and resurrection. I want you to remember that statement. To live anything less is to deny the purpose of the cross and the resurrection. If Jesus died for us and he said, you need this so you can be a miracle worker, and I'm going to give you power to do this violently in the earth, 
And we say, I, I, I don't need that. And most of us don't want it because it's embarrassing. Because we know the rejection that comes with it when people find out you're one of them. But if you just go ahead and become one of them, you don't have a reputation anyway. And I promise you, your reputation is not as good as you think it is. If I could just talk to a few people that know you pretty well, they could tell me a few different things about you. And here you are guarding something that's probably not that important. <laughs> and so you might as well lose it. You know, I lost it. We film everything. I've lost every piece of dignity I can have. Undeniable. It's all over the Internet. All right? So they, they good. You know, Jesus, you made me look like a fool, so therefore I am. And a fool for Christ. That's what we should be. Everybody with me on that? All right? So fast forward. Day of Pentecost comes. We see what happens. And they're now endued with power. And now the culture. Now we're going to move to the culture. The culture, the political arena, the spiritual arena, all the Pharisees, all those people, they are, they are now aware that a great sign has come to these people, these weird people that are not part of their group. And so I want you to understand that when you start manifesting power, you're an affront to anybody that has authority or power in the earth. And so there's a battle that goes on there. So they're, they're upset with what they're hearing. They're hearing these people testify, it says, of the mighty deeds of God. That's what they're doing. Now these spirits became angry, and they began to turn the culture against these people. And because they had an empire that they were protecting. And the supernatural, listen, listen to me, challenges every earthly empire. And so we see these powers in Washington, in Baton Rouge, and all these other cities around the country, around the nations. And the question is, do we see the supernatural confronting them? I knew a prophet once that he was so accurate in his prophecy, they gave him a red phone at his house that he could pick it up and give the president a prophecy because he was so accurate and he scared the presence to death of how accurate he was. We don't have any more red phones. We need some red phones where we're going to say, the president's going to say, what's God saying? Hmm. Do you know President Trump is pro-life because he had a prophetic experience? Rick Joyner tells the testimony, doesn't tell exactly what happened, but he said, Trump had such a powerful prophetic experience, either a dream or something, that came to him that he turned from being pro-choice to being pro-life. And now he's considered one of the most pro-life presidents we've ever had because the supernatural shifted his heart. And there you are thinking he needs to be cast to hell. See, God will speak to anybody. I, I won't go down that road, all right? So these spirits became angry and began to turn against them. So what are we facing today? What are the threats to our faith today? We're being told to keep our story out of the public arenas. That's what we're being told. Listen to this. California has a law coming up that's probably going to pass that will make it illegal for pastors to speak about transforming somebody's gender. Like if they're a transgender or a homosexual, they'll not be allowed to talk about the supernatural power of God to deliver that person. Somebody say something. Oh, my. That's coming to our culture. It's already there as far as counselors. If a, if a person comes into the office, you're not allowed to talk that person out of what they believe. The parents are not allowed to do it. That's in California. As California goes, so goes our nation. So we better rock with the supernatural. Amen? Amen. Hate speech has been threatened against us if we, if we preach against political correctness. The church in Europe has already shut down many. I mean, the, the church in Europe has been shut down already by many of these institutions. A recent law case in England, a man was preaching on the street saying Jesus is the only way. They took him to court, and the court condemned him because they said it was hate speech because they knew that Jesus was not the only way. And so we think, well, that's Europe. It's coming. The church of Acts 
was being told now that they could not take Jesus to the public places. They said, you can talk about all this other spiritual stuff, but don't use his name. That's being told to us in America already. There was laws in the Northeast a few years ago that said you cannot use Jesus' name in public prayer anymore. Right after they passed the laws, there were five states up there that passed the law. Within two months, an earthquake hit that whole area, and all five states were shaken. Because God's saying, look, my name will be proclaimed, all right? And that's what it's going to take, the supernatural. See, if you don't manifest it, God will, all right? So I cannot tell you when people, when we need to deal with these issues in our culture, how many times people have come to me in my ministry and have said to me, if we could just get the pastors together and we could get unified, we can change our city. I have lost count how many times I've been told that. First of all, getting pastors together is like herding cats. I mean, it's just impossible, number one. But to get them to agree on anything when they get there is, is second to amazing. Now, that would be the real supernatural. But they feel like if we can just get unity, we can change our culture. Or they'll say, if we just not, we're not praying enough. And I agree. Unity is very important. Prayer is very important. Extremely. But I think they should be an outgrowth of the supernatural. Our worship service Friday night and centenary is not because we want to pray for our city. It's because the prophetic supernatural word came and said, do this. And so we're manifesting the supernatural. And so God wants to deal with our culture more than just trying to, to use Scripture to break stuff, uh, us quoting Scripture to people. He wants the Scripture manifested in us. And so there, he has another way to deal with these issues. And so if you remember, if we follow the story, Peter and John pray for the lame beggar. Remember at the Gate Beautiful? Everyone knew him in the community, and he gets supernaturally healed. He's up and walking. He's, been, he's like over 40 years old. So every, he'd been at the gate all his whole life begging for money, and he gets healed. And everyone is filled with wonder and amazement, the Scripture says. And Peter takes this opportunity, opportunity to declare that what happened to this man was part of what Jesus suffered for. And he wanted everybody to know that and that these experiences. And so the spiritual and political rulers were in a bind because they, these guys were preaching about the cross and resurrection in public arenas. So they had Peter and John arrested because we got to stop this stuff. And Acts 4 and 8 says, tells us that Peter spoke with great boldness when the Scripture, and he said, he, was, he said because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The people were amazed that these, un, these ordinary, untrained people were talking like this and manifesting this stuff. That's what we're called to. So the Lord gave me this passage, and I'm going to let John come up right after this. Uh, Acts 4.14, as I heard this Scripture, and then Steve confirmed it. He had the same Scripture. So this man gets healed, and 4.14, Acts 4.14, it says, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. So we want to shut up the culture. We need to get some people healed that they know about and make them speechless. So now they're scrambling. What do we do now? We can't deny that this guy's healed. We all know him. Everybody knows him. And so the, they're, they're, we've got to stop this move. So they decided to make this decree you couldn't talk about Jesus. Does that sound familiar? We're seeing that in our own nation. So the church went into prayer and said, what do we do next? What do we do next now that they're making us not talk about, try to make us not talk about Jesus? Here's what we do today. When the church, when the government tells us to do this thing, we say we need to get hold of our con congressman. We need to call our state rep, our state senator. We need to start a petition. These are our first acts. And so we, we look to politicians to fight for us, and we demand that our rights, and so we're going to start arguing. So we have debates, public debates. We have inter uh, social media debates, and we have this intellectual argument of why we should have these rights. I'm not saying they're all bad, but let's look how the early church dealt with it. In verse 29, of Acts chapter 4. 
And he said, this is their prayer room. They said, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. Okay? So they, they said, Lord, we're being threatened. They're telling us we can't talk about Jesus. We can't say anything in the public place about him. They say we can't manifest his kingdom of God. You hear their threats. And it says this, grant that your bond servants, remember, a witness is a martyr to worker, to become a worker of miracles. And it says, grant your bond servants that we may speak the word with all boldness. <laughs> See, we like to call our politicians and say, be bold, be strong, for the Lord our God is with you. And these guys didn't ask for somebody else to be bold. They said, Lord, let us be the ones. Give us the boldness. So what that means, why did they need boldness? Because they were weak and they were scared. So it's okay to be that way, but just don't stay there. And so they prayed this, and they said, Lord, with confidence. And while you extend, it says, and while you extend your hand to heal, with signs and wonders take place through your holy, uh, through your holy servant, Jesus. So what was their prayer? Give us boldness for signs, wonders, and miracles. That is not a political way to deal with this problem. We do not do that in the church today. I want us to get on our knees and begin to pray when these threats come and say, Lord, use me to confront that issue and begin to deal with these issues that are unbiblical. And that I had, you know, as you know, I, I, I lobby for Israel. And there was a very influential Jewish man who was challenging me. Uh, up in Washington, of why I wouldn't support the two-state solution of dividing Israel. And he was frustrated with me because I'm one of the leaders in this organization. And so he says, why don't you do this? And I said, because. I said, Joel chapter 3 says that he comes against any nation who divides the land of Israel. And I looked at him and I said, I fear God more than I fear you. And he was shocked and just silenced by that moment. And I, I said, Lord, where'd that boldness come from? <laughs> you know, it was just like, because this guy, he can shut me out of the organization. He can take away my authority. But I thought, no, I have to fear God more than I fear a man. So that's what can happen when supernatural boldness comes upon you. You begin to confront in the right way. And so we need to pray. And that's what it goes on. It says on here, the next verse, and come on up, John. And when, they, when he had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Now, these people were already filled with the Holy Spirit. So what happens? That means there are, there's one baptism but many infillings. And so every infilling is for an outpouring. That, that's better than, than, y than I, yeah, I spoke there. But anyway... Every infilling is for an outpouring. God doesn't give you something to keep. He gives you to give it out. And so we want to see this place shaken again. We want our city shaking again. We want you shaken again and so that you can pour out again, all right? Add to it, John. All right. Um, when, I, when he was texting me the other day and was asking me, I, I was like, okay, uh, you know, when Jesus was on earth, one of the things he announced, he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so I'm going to repeat some of the things he said, but it's something that you have to understand, is that when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is saying that a new system, the way that the system was designed, the way that he created it to be, is now coming and advancing into the earth. And when we uh, become kingdom-minded people, we say, I want to participate with that advancing of the kingdom that pushes. And there's two sides to the, the, the kingdom. There's one of them where Jesus, if you look in the rules of war in Deuteronomy, the, one of the first things it does when they came to take over a city is they announced peace to it. They said, hey, we want, it, we want to extend peace to you. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit can do through you is you show someone the peace and the goodness of God and you show you serve them and everything. But then there comes a point where if they reject that peace, it's a war. And this this thing right now that we're doing this weekend is really an announcement of war against the spirit of religion in our city. 
We're saying we're taking a spiritual stand and we're saying that peace has been extended to it long enough. But now is the time where we are going to be uh, purposely offensive to that spirit. And we're saying we're going to drive through because we want the kingdom. Now, let me tell you this. Religion has two sides. And we as a prophetic community a lot of times have limited religion to those that just don't like creative expression in worship. And they don't, they have what, what I would call a small box of God in the sense of God only operates this way. And they don't take the whole counsel of Scripture and look at some of the other things the way God operates. We've limited to that. But there's another side of religion that seems to be creeping in more and more in America, and it's that of the Sadducees. And if you, the Sadducees were like the elite political uh, people in the city. They were, they were a re- people who were an established religious order illegitimately. When I add, they weren't Levites or anything like that, unbiblical to begin with. But they were established, and one of the things about them was they liked to be greeted in public. And Jesus called them out on it. He said, you like it when people come and re- greet you in the public square. And that's another thing of religion. If we're not careful and we're not dependent on the Holy Spirit, we become one of those people where I'm just happy that people like me in public. You know, and, and as a prophetic community, I'm, I'm talking to us because, you know, judgment starts in the house of God. It's really time to check yourself on where your rejection level is, really. Because, because we're, when you start moving in this thing, you're going to get rejected on some level, and you got to be comfortable with it. you got to be comfortable with just saying, hey, this is what it is. And, and you've got to you've gotta get your mindset where that's not really going to bother me that bad. It's really not. We teach in our class. I'm not going to go through it systematically today. I'm just going to talk from my heart. But, you know, usually you have three, three responses when you talk to people. You either have people go, that's bull. I don't want to hear it. You have people that sit there and go, hmm, that's interesting. I'll hear you again. Or you have people that say, hey, you know what? I believe that. I want to follow you and learn from you. Okay? Two-thirds of that is, is a good, it's, it's okay. Right? It's only one-third. But we focus on that one-third so much that it prevents us from participating with the two-thirds that God said. He says in 1 John, you were put on earth to destroy the works of the devil. Okay? And the Holy Spirit is always there to sit there and bring you into a confrontation where you destroy the work of the devil. And one of the confrontations that happens when the Holy Spirit came, you understand, all of the languages that were heard were actual languages at that point. Now, we know that there's tongues of angels and tongues of men, but these were tongues of men And everybody started realizing, wait a minute, I'm hearing it in my own language, my own culture. I can hear it. I can hear it, and I understand what's going on. Do you understand the Holy Spirit is the only way you're really going to have unity with people? It really is. If you go read John 17 where Jesus is talking about, hey, I may be one. Would you be one just as I want them to be as one as we are one? He says it twice in that passage. And the first time, he's talking about our unity with Father, where we're just like Jesus. And then the second one is talking about unity among people. And we, a lot of times, get it backwards. We want unity of people to show that we're unity with the Father, when really we have to get in unity with the Father first in His Spirit. Then we'll have unity. You cannot have unity without the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, you can't. I have a friend that I... we. We, uh, we, we rumble a little bit on, on, on different political things. We have a little bit different perspective on some different things. But you know what? I can walk in unity with that person because they have the Holy Spirit. And at the end of the day, we just have different ideas. For the, for the, we have different ideas on how to solve a problem. All right? And I have full faith that if we, were, we probably, if we would actually talk to God, we'd get the same answer. Right? I firmly believe that. If we talk to God, we're all going to get the same answers eventually. And so we want to make sure that this thing, I was thinking of my own uh, story. Uh, I actually learned about the Holy Spirit at this church uh, through the Royal Ranger program uh, <laughs> back in the day. If you remember, it's like an AG uh, uh, Boy Scouts. And they used to have this thing when, we, uh, when they owned the property back here. It was eight years old. It was called The Hut. And it was where we did all the Royal Ranger uh, events. And we would go out there. And, I mean, and that commander was hardcore. He was, he was an awesome uh, commander, is what they call the leader of the troops, because uh, he was real good about the Bible, but he was also, you know, they had competitions, and he, and he was really instilled in me that winning is the fun part. And so, you know, we really want to compete with these things. And let me tell you, 
when it comes to things in the spirit realm, winning is the fun part. I don't want to be a loser. <laughs> if I'm losing, I'm asking why. I, and, and it's my full intent to win, right? Because if I'm put on the earth to destroy the works of the devil, I don't want a partial destruction. I want a total destruction. I don't want it. I see that, you know, when, this, you know, when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, he destroyed Egypt to where they didn't come back. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants to destroy the things in us so we don't even think about it anymore. And so when I was there, um, I, I was eight years old. I still remember uh, being in that, in that room. I remember the name of my teacher. Her name was Miss Adele Sirio. Uh, she lives in Colorado now. I haven't talked to her in 30-something years probably. Um, but she told me it was just a simple thing. She said, she told us about the Holy Spirit. I always remember this thing. She said, the Holy Spirit is extra power that enables you to fight. It gives you the strength to fight and that you know that you're supposed to be in the fight. And I remembered that, and I was like, okay. It's really awesome. I was eight years old. Went home that night. I was in my bunk bed, and uh, I had a demon show up in my room. Saw two glowing eyes on the wall that were yellow. And uh, I was eight years old, and I was like, oh, my God. Uh, I probably didn't say that. I was just like, oh, yeah. Uh, And my first thought was like, okay, I need to go get my dad. And then, I just, then you know, you're, when you're eight, your mind's like, I can't, can't get out of bed because the demon might get me. So what do I do? I can't go get my dad because if I get out of bed, the demon's going to get me. Uh, and I started thinking, and I remembered those words that she said. I remembered Miss Adele saying, the Holy Spirit will give you extra power if you'll, if you'll just ask for it. And I was like, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit. I just closed my eyes. I put my hands. I said, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit. And I I started speaking in tongues right then. That's when I started speaking, and I was I was sitting there and I started speaking in tongues at that thing. <laughs> you know, speaking in tongues. I probably in hindsight I was building myself up to believe that I had the faith to actually command that thing to leave, but at the time I was just like shut da 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 da, and uh, and it left, and I and I realized that I had won a battle right, and I didn't need my dad to come fight for me. I could fight. I can participate. You know, the Holy Spirit enables you to realize that you can fight when there's nobody else with you. And in weakness and trembling, you can get in there and go, I can do this. You know, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 2, I mean, uh, he said this. He said, uh, he said, he says this. He said, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with a superiority of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. And my message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So, you know, you understand, many of us don't ever take a step into the supernatural because we we're, we're, I'm not adequate to talk to somebody. I'm weakness, and I'm in fear, Right? But Paul knew, Paul knew he was. He had to deal with this internal confrontation that the Holy... See, one of the things it says in John 14 is that the Holy Spirit will guide you into truth. Paul's, Paul, part of his destiny was to go speak before kings. But he was taken into a foreign land that he knew nothing about. This is somebody who has been grown up in Jewish culture. That's, he's steeped in it. That's all he knows. And now he's sent to this foreign culture where they don't do stuff, right? They're like on a scale of 1 to 10 in their knowledge of God and His ways, they're a zero. They're a zero. And he has to sit there in much weakness and fear and trembling, but he knows that's what he's supposed to do. But he has that ability to where he can sit there and say, hey, I can still fight. I can still press on to this. And he said, I, I don't have the best words. I don't have the best illustrations, but I've got a power within me that can change the atmosphere. I've got a power that can sit there and it can shift something. And if I'll be consistent, it will shift something. Angels will start to gather where I'm at. Because, you know, when the Spirit comes, it says that there's angels that come with it. There's a wind that comes in. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when it says there's a violent, a violent rushing wind, I want to propose to you that, that that focused prayer of that opened up something in the spirit realm where there was a violent rushing in of angels that came to begin to assist them and connect them to something that 
wasn't just local, but now it's global. And see, that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is it brings you into a confrontation where you don't just think about yourself anymore. You're connected to something that's way bigger than you, and you begin to get solutions and begin to have a heart to see those things change into the kingdom of God. You begin to fulfill what Jesus said, on earth as it is in heaven. I want to sit there. I'm connected now, so it's not... It's not just, Jesus said you start with uh, Jerusalem first, right? They'd been doing that. But then to the other utter ends of the earth. They hadn't got that utter ends of the earth part yet. And the Holy Spirit opened it up. There were angels that came in. And if you read in Acts 4 what he just read, where they took a stand against the religious political leaders, it says that they played, and it says that another rushing wind came in, and they were filled. And what we're doing here on Friday is we're saying, Lord, we want that mighty rushing wind to come in. We are declaring that thing to where it will connect us to something that's bigger than ourselves. You don't, see, um, you don't see the disciples in the New Testament arguing about who's the greatest anymore. They argue about who to associate with, who's going to get them to their destiny, but they no longer have this competition thing of, well, I'm better than you because I did 50 miracles and... You know, I, you know, you didn't only raise three people from the dead. You're a chump, you know. They didn't have that thing. Okay? It says this. It says this, uh, it says this in verse 9 in 2 Corinthians. Says, it says, But just as it is written, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those that love him. You understand when you when you have when you love God, you begin to see things differently. It opens you up to the plans that people have not seen, and and they have not entered even into the heart of man. You know and that's why it says in Psalms it says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart." What that means is is not that you can like you know, I'm going to delight myself in the Lord, and I get a Maserati. Is that the desire of my heart? I, I think I'd go with the Bugatti. But the, the, uh, <laughs> he's, not, he's not saying that. He's saying, as you delight yourself in him, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. I created you. I know what I created you to be. I'm going to put it in you, and you will realize it and then start moving for it. And it won't be just for yourself. It'll be something that's generational. It'll be generational. And, and it's something that we, it gets you excited And it says this, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. The depths of God. And and I think about the depths of God, that is a big, huge topic. I remember one time, I wish I had a pen and paper, I remember one time during one of the conferences, you know, I would drive the speakers around, and I remember one time we were with Pastor Tim's, and Bob Jones just started talking about the different realms in the heavenly realm. And he was like, you know, talking and saying, he's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the mystical realm. And then this is the glory realm. And, then, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there going, what? I thought the mystical realm and the glory realm was the same thing. And he lists off like 12 different realms that he's been to. I haven't. I'm just telling you what he said. But I think, wow, the Spirit searches those things out. Who knows what realm you have? Now, see, here's the thing. God will give you a depth of himself that will be put in you to the, to the realm that you're supposed to influence. He'll put that in your spirit where you, there's something where, see, the spirit, it, it, it gives you this thing where you go, it, you employ it into a service. You sit there and, and you go, okay, I've got the spirit, now how do I serve uh, people with it? And, it, and it's, so, uh, it's, it's so exciting because what it does is it expands it to where, you know how God operates, but you always ask him every time how, how you're supposed to fight. I remember, I, heard, I read this story the other day. And this is not in the Bible. This guy, he, uh, uh, the guy who tells this story was talking about how they were doing a crusade in England. They are uh, going to, uh, they're trying to get people saved. It's in England, and it's really, really hard. And they have this one guy who's on their team that just decides, He's going to go backpacking or hiking throughout uh, <laughs> England 
and just try to get some people saved. So he leaves, I guess with the blessing of the leader, he didn't just cut out on him, but he goes and he comes back and he goes, I got 21 people saved in two weeks. And the guy's like, what? 21, it, it, he felt like, I mean, they, I guess the, the uh, conference or crusade didn't really go very well because he was like, that's, that's pretty impressive. He said, how did you do that? And he goes, well, he said, um, I was praying for people. And then what I told him to do was I said, smell my hand. <laughs> okay. And when these people smelled this guy's hand, all of a sudden, it triggered a childhood memory that they needed healing, and it was so specific, he was able to speak the love of God to them, and then they ended up coming to the Lord. Now, that is bizarre. That is only a Holy Spirit-led thing, because, you know, and I'm not trying to make a model out of that. I don't recommend that. <laughs> don't really smell my hand. Pull my finger. It's not a, it's not a good... I'm just telling you, it's not, it's not a... You, you, that's a spirit-led thing, right? Because something in the depths of God knew that that's what they needed r at the right place at the right time. And uh, I remember I uh, there was one time I was doing an outreach uh, with some people, and uh, we had a lady uh, who was on our team who was real religious. And what I mean by religious was uh, she wanted to just come out and see somebody do something supernatural and just kind of get in on it, rather than participate with doing it. And so uh, she would hop from corner to corner, uh, criticizing uh, different members of the team because she thought that they were not maybe being love or whatever, and uh, not doing anything, but she's just criticizing the love. And she's got this really, and I, I tell you what, I hate that kind of stuff. I can't. I can't stand, I cannot stand, this lady had a spirit of religion. I could tell you what it feels like later, but I was sitting there, and I was like, God, I hope this lady doesn't come this next night. We're going out to dinner before, and uh, I sit down, and sure enough, she sits right down across from me, and my spirit is just like, God, we're going to fight. <laughs> and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, it's something in my spirit. My spirit gets, is agitated. I'm like, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with this lady? And he said, I want you to order a margarita and drink it in front of her. <laughs> and all God's people said, amen. No, they, 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 so I sat there and my mind, my mind went through the checklist, right? I was like, is this really the Lord? What if there are people here at this table that have problems with alcohol? There are people at this table that I know in the natural who have had problems with alcohol. Lord, is this really you? Right? Because that is in the scripture, right? It tells you, like, don't make your brother stumble, right? If you've got strong in an area, don't make your brother stumble, right? So that's, that's my first thought, right? But we got a big box here, right? We want the whole counsel of God. Right? The Holy Spirit directs the whole thing. So I was like, well, I'll charge it to the game. So I charged my credit card. So I ordered it. And let me tell you what, this lady got offended at the fact that I was having a margarita. So she said, she's like, you're going to, you're going to, you, you just ordered a margarita. I was like, yeah. And she goes, uh, you're, you're about to go do an outreach. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm, we're going to drink one. We're not going out for another two hours. <laughs> She's like, well, I just, hmm. I didn't say anything to her the rest of the night. She left. She didn't come out that night. I was like, yay, God. Uh, <laughs> see, because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows the right strategy. Okay, and, and, the, and the air that we get a lot of times, I'm telling you what I really believe is going to happen. You know, one of the things is the spirit of breakthrough. Philistines are attacking. David says, Lord, am I supposed to fight this battle? He said, yeah, you're going to go fight them and you're going to go hit them straight on. Boom, beat them. Came back, 
But the Philistine still came back. He asked the Lord again. He always asks. See, the Holy Spirit is this thing where we're just asking. It's just a relationship where we constantly are like, Lord, do I fight this? How do I fight? The Lord asked, David asked him again. He says, Lord, do I do that? He goes, no, I don't want you to hit him straight on. I want you to go around beside him here and flank him. And when you hear the sound of the wind in the tops of the trees, then I want you to attack. See, the Lord directed it each time. And when we have the Holy Spirit, we're directed into, into time that where we, we battle things and we're in the right place at the right time. I remember, who was it? Bob Weiner, I think, was told to be at a certain place at a certain time when he was in Russia, runs into a guy and, who need, who's a political figure that needs help uh, writing, writing something, and he ends up writing part of the Constitution, right, for, at the time, I think they've thrown it out since then, but they, they, he's wrote part of their Constitution, right, because he was in the right place at the right time. The Holy Spirit bring that confrontation right there. He brings it in there. And what we've got to do is we've got to be af- not afraid of confrontation. We have to realize that confrontation takes many forms. You understand when you pray for healing for somebody, it's a confrontation with the kingdom of darkness, right? There's no arguing, right? Most people will not argue with you if you say, hey, can I pray for you? you want to be, you're sick. You want to be healed. Oh, yeah. No, I want to fight about it. No, people don't. That's part, but it's a confrontation. And what, what we believe is God wants to release strategy for every single thing. He wants, to, he wants to release power with administration. You know, when jo- one other example, when Joseph came into Pharaoh to interpret his dream, the, the Egyptians were one of the most sophisticated dream-interpreting cultures of their time. They actually have the oldest known dream dictionary of symbols in the world. You can go to the London History of Natural Museum and Science and see it. They had a hundred symbols that were positive, like 200 that were negative, and then they had a separate one uh, for women, the symbols in women's dreams. They had a whole new category. That's how, that's how up on dreams they were. So when they, Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't interpret, it's because the system didn't work. And Joseph came in with a system of heaven and a system of administration that ended up saving a nation. Now, let me tell you what. You, you may not save a nation, but you can save some people. And that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're about, right? I want to bring someone into an encounter with God because who knows what they'll do, right? And uh, it's always about uh, confrontation. And we can't be afraid of it. The Holy Spirit does not want us to be afraid of that. And uh, I, uh, I, re- I remember one time they had a, I was up at the, uh, it was called the uh, Baptist Student Union at the time. And uh, I had some friends that were there. And uh, they knew I was a Holy Spirit guy. So they, um, <clears throat> I had, but you know, I got along real good with my friends. But um I had some of their friends at the Baptist Student Union found out that I was, and they decided that they wanted to kind of pick a fight with me, not knowing that I had a very big mouth and I was very belligerent and I was a smart aleck. Uh, and so they, this guy was just hardcore. He was an associate pastor, actually at a church here, was about to go to seminary. And he was just, their big thing is Benny Hinn for some reason. They like to focus on, uh, on Benny, uh, which in my mind I was like, dude, that guy's like, not even really that wild. Like, I, that was where my mind was at the time. So he said, uh, he quotes something out of Benny Hinn's book about, uh, Benny Hinn talked about how he went and uh, laid on the, laid or went to the grave of Catherine Kuhlman and asked for her anointing, right? And uh, and he was like, that is so weird, or whatever. And I'm not saying go to a graveyard and do, I know there's something on the internet with like graves sucking and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. It was like people had made a doctrine or something out of it. Um, he, he went and he just said, I want that. And so, so he goes, that is so unscriptural, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, I said, I'll give you that. I said, that's weird. I was like, I personally am not going to go to a grave. I said, but it does, does say in the scripture that they threw a dead man and he touched Elisha's bones and he came back to life. 
So don't say it's unscriptural. So you had a small box there, and we want to have the whole, we want to be the whole, have the whole counsel of God. We say that all the time. The sum of thy words is truth, is what it says in Psalm 119. When the angel freed Peter out of that jail, to, to, he said, go speak the whole message of life to the people. The Holy Spirit helps you deliver the whole message. It knows whether the person needs correction. It knows when the person needs gentleness and kindness. It knows. It searches the depths, and it has every answer for that person. And, and we want to be people that tap into that. And we want to we not be uh, passive in the sense that we don't understand what's going on. We don't. We want to understand that it is a, an announcement of the kingdom of heaven, and it is a, is a declaration that there is a new system coming. And, and, and here's the thing. Many of us don't, don't feel adequate of it because we, we know ourselves and we're all in process because the Holy Spirit brings us into that process, right? We're all wounded healers in a sense, okay? We all are. It doesn't matter who it is. But here's the thing. When you tap into the Holy Spirit and the Word, it's truth. It, it is not debatable in the spirit realm. Truth is still truth even if it's from a hypocrite. I could sit here and tell, I could be the most promiscuous person in the world and sit up here and tell you that sex outside of marriage is wrong, and I'd be telling you this truth. I could tell it's truth. Now, you may not really take very much account of it because you don't see me practicing, and you may say, that's not really working, right? doesn't change the fact that it's truth in the spirit realm. And so when, you, when, you, when, when he, Paul says, I didn't come with wisdom or philosophy, he said that because he said, I don't want your faith to depend on just persuasive words because Paul understood there's something that's deeper than just the intellect, and the spirit bypasses the intellect, and goes straight to the heart of the matter, okay? It bypassed my intellect to drink a margarita. I would never say that to somebody. I'm not telling you to go out and do it today. But, it by, but I'm just saying it bypasses that intellect to where it gets on that deeper thing. It's like the music of the Spirit. You know how music can just touch your emotions on a way, the intellect? You know, if you broke down any kind of song and asked somebody to explain, like, why did you like this song? A lot of people couldn't explain it, but they know it just touches something in them. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's like the music of the spirit realm and the soul, and it gets into you. And Paul said, because somebody said this one time, if I can talk you into Jesus, I can talk you out of it. And that's not what we want. We want disciples, not converts. A disciple is somebody that learns, is not just saying that I'm part of the club. And we, that Holy Spirit, and we want that. And let me tell you, when we go this weekend, I really feel like it's, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I, uh, I was just like, I'm really interested to see what the prophetic is in this meeting. Because I don't know. But I know that it's a declaration of war against this spirit that we you know, briefly talked about earlier. One of them is having a narrow box. The other one is being greeted in public. It's going to be an assault on that. Because it's like the Lord has just said, I've extended peace to this long enough I've given it time, I've given it chances, and now I'm declaring I'm against it. I'm against it. And it's going to be something where your mindset when you come into 10 will begin to sit here and say, hey, I'm against this thing, full-heartedly. I'm against it in every single form. I'm not going to fall into any trap on either side. I'm not going to get to where I have a narrow box, and then I'm not going to get on the other side that's like, you know what, we're just getting drunk because we have freedom in Christ. That's not freedom, right? That's against the word. I'm not saying you can't have a drink, but don't get drunk. I'm just saying we don't want to be on either side. We want to be right in the middle. You know, it's like when the Lord of hosts come and Joshua said, Hey, are you on this side or that side? I'm on the Lord's side. I want to be on the kingdom side. And I want to have kingdom solutions that are a lot of times are not either side. It's right there. It's right what you need. The Holy Spirit is a customized tailor for every situation. And we, we want to tap into that. Situational things where it gets customized and it fits right where we're at. And when I trust the Lord when he says he, the Lord never takes us into a war, he hasn't equipped us to win. Never does. And, and we got to take confidence in that. Even when we feel weak, even in, in the trembling, and the, man, I don't know what we're do, I'm doing. He's right there. 
You know, you think about Paul. It wasn't some easy thing that Paul did. If you read in the book in Corinthians, he said that he stayed with the Corinthian church, and he said he admonished them for three years with tears. <laughs> three years with tears. Sounds like a song title or something, but three years. He's sitting there with this group of people just going, no. <laughs> Oh, my God, no. This is the way it's supposed to be. But see, that's another thing the Holy Spirit puts in you is that consistency to know that you're called to do. You push through whatever pain comes. You push through the tears because at the end of the day, just like Jesus, when he went to the cross, it said he despised the shame for the glory set before him. You begin to be like Christ in the sense you despise whatever shame comes your way from people because you see the glory that is at the end. You see that it's all worth it. And so, uh, I don't know how you want to close here. We could have the worship team come. And uh, I feel like we're just to pray for your boldness today to deal with that fear issue. I want to sing that song again. They just sang about the arrow. That we just be shot out for those gates. And I thought about this um, this week. Um, right out here, if you go out, if you want to look in the parking lot, we had lightning hit one of the trees. And it drew a straight line down the tree. I mean, it's just, you look at it, it's incredible. Barks flying everywhere. John said it shook his house, right? Pictures off the wall. And, uh, uh, ooh, that's good. Off the music building back here, the, actually the pictures just came off the wall. And I thought about that place they were in was filled with shaking again. And um, when I, I said, Lord, what is that about? You know, are we being judged? <laughs> What's the deal? And he said, no, my word rightly divides. And I'm coming to this place to divide the hearts of men. And I'm going to divide between the soul and the spirit. And I really feel like it's a sign to us and a wonder that God's about to do something in our midst. In such a way, it, it's quite scary what's been going on since we decided to do this outreach. And uh, the warfare just ramped up uh, to another level. Uh, witchcraft, just crazy stuff going on. But God is so faithful. And when John was saying this story about, about Paul doing in 1 Corinthians 2, you understand that is, he, he spoke a message in Acts 17. It's called the Sermon on Mars Hill where he's speaking to philosophers and brainiacs because Paul was the most brainiac person in the world. Nobody was smarter than him and could debate better than him. And so he preaches to them, and after he gives this great speech, of course, nobody comes to the Lord, but he gives this great speech, and he walks from Athens to Corinth, and he makes this statement. He says, I'm not coming with words anymore, basically. I'm coming with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words... I've talked to the intellectuals. It doesn't shift them. <laughs> what, what shifts them is the supernatural. And I've come here to demonstrate that to you. I can talk with the big dogs. And I think there's a place to do that. It's more so for the other listeners than it is for the actual people you talk to. But there's a place for that. And I'm telling you, there's a greater place for the supernatural to be demonstrated. And if it can be known in the city, and I want to see this. I want to see, let's believe for a miracle that the whole city and the whole region would say, that's God. In the 80s, and I shared it last week, and I'll I'll shut up. In the 80s, we had a meeting here with Mario Murillo, and some of y'all were here. Randy Grigsby was healed in that meeting. He's not here right now. But um, in the meeting, we were at this church, and it was growing. But there was a man that came. And he was a Baptist who didn't believe in supernatural healing. But he was well-known in the city. He was an umpire in softball and baseball, and he was a mailman. He was just a well-known guy in the entire city. Everybody knew him. That was, you know, just he was part of the culture here. And he came, and his family said, look, you're about to die of cancer. He, he had cancer, four, uh, stage 4 cancer. He was about to die. And they said, we heard there's healing at this meeting. Let's go. And they drug him here. And Mario calls him out. He was the first man he called out. He was sitting like right over there. And he says, sir, you have cancer. It's four stages. They told you you're not going to live. I want you to know God says tonight you're being healed, completely healed right now in Jesus' name. Of course, the guy didn't know because he didn't believe God did that. <laughs> so even God will heal a skeptic. 
So he went to the doctor three days later, and he tells the story, just like I told you uh, um, earlier uh, about the other guy. And that's very similar to the story here of the lame beggar. And he went and told his doctor, he said, Look, I went to this crazy meeting. This guy called me out. He didn't know me from the man on the moon. He said, I have cancer. Described it, and that's what I have. And he says, I'm not, I don't have it anymore. You check me out. See if I got this thing. And so they did the test, and they did them again. And they, I think they did them three times, two or three times, because they didn't believe the results. And he had no cancer. He said, I don't, we don't know what to tell you, but you're healed. And it, it got the, the media got wind of it, and they wrote a story, and they made the front page of the living section of the paper. And they put it out there that they told the whole story of the meetings here and what God was doing. We had full front page publicity for free of what was happening. The next meeting, this place didn't have room to handle the people because the news hit. And so we had to move it downtown to the Civic Theater because the miracle, and it kept growing and it kept growing. And there were city officials coming to our meetings because they knew this man and they couldn't deny what happened to him. Even the Pharisees showed up. We had Pharisees on the platform. I'm talking about full-blown card-carrying Pharisees who one of them I know didn't even believe in God, but he, he's one of the pastors of the largest church in the city. I tried to witness to him for years. I witnessed to a pastor. And he told me, he, he said, you can get to God any way you want. You can serve that tree and find God. That's what he would tell me. And, and then finally, at the end of his life, when he was dying, I was his, I was his therapist in, in rehab. I took care of him for two years as he was dying. As he's dying, he said to me, his name is D.L. Dykes, if you all know him. He used to be pastor of First Methodist. He was a full new ager, complete new age. That's what he was into. And he said to me, he goes, do you all do that thing at the end of your church where you call people forward, pray for them? What do you all call that? I said, it's called an altar call. He goes, yeah. He says, he goes, do you all still do that? And I said, yeah. He goes, do you believe in that? I said, I absolutely do. He said, you know what? I think I need the Lord. And I said, I do too, D.L. <laughs> and so at the end of his life, every day I'd, ther I'd take him through therapy. Every day he'd ask me, do you experience God? Is he real in your life? And so he was going full circle because I understood he started as a fire-breathing preacher and went into some false theology and got off, and now he was coming back full circle at the end of his life. And the supernatural was what he was drawn to. And that's what we need, right? We can draw people to the supernatural, and that's what God wants to do in your life. But you need boldness. We need to deal with this rejection issue. And I understand some of your personalities are not good in public forum. You know, I'm better with I have somebody with me. I'm not good by myself so much. But, like, if I have somebody with me, that's just my personality, it really helps. I get extra supernatural boldness. And there's something about Jesus said, don't go out by ones, go out by twos. So there's something about that as well. Look, you pray for me. I'll pray for you, you know, and just tag team. And I, that's what I want. So as we sing this song, I want to take communion, and I want to do our offering at the same time. But I want you to, we're going to pray for you to have boldness this morning. Uh, Walter, if you'll come, get the guys. And I want us to believe for boldness in our lives. Now, last week we got the Holy Spirit. In chapter 4, it says the place they were at was shaken again, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. So why not get a double dose? You know what, son? I don't know. What's your name? Andres? Andre. Yeah, there's a real gift for the supernatural in you. It's something that's been dormant in your life. It's not been fully active for many years. But even as a little boy, you believed beyond you were in a dreamer. I saw that as a little boy. You just dreaming crazy stuff. You had this imagination that was really out there, very creative, very gifted in that way because you didn't want to be stuck in a box. And there's somebody in, 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 in the, around you, I don't know who it was, some leaders, teachers, whatever, and they tried to put you in a box and say you're this and give you a different identity. But that is not your identity. Your identity is to function in the supernatural and to demonstrate the love of God. And there's a creativity in you that is locked up. And God said, I want to take a key and unlock your heart and let that creativity come. You're really called to this generation and this culture. I saw you actually begin to attack the entertainment industry and begin to speak life into that thing and begin to rock that whole inner industry with the power of God. And you're not just to be an observer and to be part of the system. You're start, you should be in there to break the system and to bring a new system, the system of the kingdom of God in there. So God's going to give him more microphone in your mouth and I saw you having a platform and beginning to speak into that thing 
So I just speak that over the, you right now. Father, I unlock this supernatural gift in this young man that he will come against, Lord, the powers of that spirit realm. And, Lord, that industry needs you more than it needs anything else right now. And, Father, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord said you will write like you've never written before. For your hand will be have the pen of the ready writer in it. And you will write things that will confound men and will draw men supernaturally to the Lord. You're to break generational cycles and to break perversion in the culture and to bring forth life in many different ways, Father. I thank you that you ignite this young man for this purpose. Yeah. Hey, your buddy there. What's his name? You've been here before, right? What's your name? Trey? Trey, I saw you as a warrior. And I saw you like a, a, I saw you had a bow and like a whole thing of arrows in your back. You know, the little quiver thing. They put the quiver in, I should say. And the Lord said, man, I'm about to build you up to be a warrior. You're, you have this soft spirit in you, but you have this strength in you. And God said you're going to have you're going to have accolades. In other words, you're going to be identified and get awards. And these awards are not just so that Trey can be somebody big. It's so that the God in Trey will be glorified. And you're going to get awards. I saw people come and say, we want you. And so there's going to be people that are going to want what you have. And they're going to say, we need you. Please do this for us. I saw many, many voices coming to you with that. And the Lord's going to give you the gift to discern who to listen to. But you're going to go to a place because God is going to shoot you out like an arrow. And you're going to go and you're going to transform cultures and generational anointing, generational curses that are in bloodlines. And God says he's given you a, a spirit to build bridges and a spirit to, to love all that are around you. And so God is going to take what was meant for evil over your family's life and your life, and he's going to turn it for good. And you're going to be a voice, and one day you're going to have a big family. You hear me? You're going to have a big family, and you're going to raise up tons of kids for the glory of God. And God sent him his wife. I'm telling you, you're going to have this radical. I know you're too young yet, but I'm telling you, you're going to have this radical family, and they're going to be a demonstration of the power of God in the earth. Lord, I just speak that over his life right now. That God, you just do that in Trey's life. Thank you, Father. All right, sorry, I got side swiped by the Holy Spirit. That's good. Thank you, Father. Man, there's power in this room. And we want this boldness. And I want you, when you come get this communion, Jesus died. That's what this bread speaks of. And this blood so that you can do this stuff. And this song here, there's a sound in our mouths and a weapon that's fierce and strong. And it can bring down walls. And see, people are like walls. And we can have a, a voice that begins to speak and begin to break down those walls and begin to speak into their life. And you guys are called to do that. Look, y'all catch these fish. We'll clean them. I'm telling you, we need your help. I can't do it. Me and John can't do it alone. Or other, just the, uh, Jim and Karen, Lindy. We can't do it by ourselves. We need the body to be the body. And this song is really talking about that and to let out my voice. That I want to do that. So let's stand. And so when you come get the bread, bring your offering as well. I want to just pray for us to have a, I believe God's going to bring the resources in for this event. We're already big money into it. <laughs> Y'all are. <laughs> if you didn't know that, it's coming out of church budget. So we just need to believe God will supernaturally continue to provide for this meeting. Nobody's given us anything for free, which is okay. Because David said, I'll not offer you something, Lord, that doesn't cost me something. And so this house is sowing into this event. And we're saying, look, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. And we're going to sow and believe God will provide. And I want you to know as you sow today, you're sowing to that event. If you want to give extra, you can. But I'm telling you, you're sowing. And God's going to provide for you as well. So, Father, I pray over everybody's offering and over this communion. Lord, I think as we come and receive, Lord, we're going to receive boldness from on high. Lord, thank you for the power that you give to produce wealth. I speak that over every life here. 
that, Lord, your answer will come to our purpose. Father, as we sow into the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Now, come and get your bread. Don't eat it yet. Take it back to your seat. And after we do this song, we're going to take bread and the wine together. And we're going to worship the Lord. Go ahead. There's a sound within our mouth And it's a weapon fierce and strong There's a sound within our mouth It can bring those walls right on want to dare, just release this decree. I want Roger to come what he saw in the spirit as well. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is head over all all, everybody say all. All rule and authority. You understand, John said this a while ago. We have a kingdom of darkness facing the kingdom of light. And the signs and wonders and miracles prove that our kingdom is greater. Just like Joseph could dream, interpret a dream that all the magicians of Egypt could not. Because we won that victory. That wasn't just a good dream interpretation. We won the victory over darkness. Daniel won the victory over the magicians of Nebuchadnezzar because he could do it as well. And so you can be made complete. And in him you were all circumcised with circumcision uh, uh, made without hands, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith and working for God, went to God to be raised 
from the dead. Okay? And it says here, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which were hostile to us, and that he has taken them out of the way and nailed them to the cross. In other words, to walk in this supernatural power, there is no debt that you owe when you give your life to Jesus that will keep you from manifesting it because he nailed it to the cross. And then he gave you the freedom so that now you can do this. And here's what he said. This is the key verse, verse 15 of Colossians 2. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. I love that verse. That we're going to make public display of the enemy being defeated. When he loses one of his champions, when he loses what he thought he's won, when he thinks he's won a city and it goes back to the Lord. And Roger saw this a minute ago. Well, come here quickly, Roger, as we take this communion. And he said, when I shared about the tree being hit by lightning, it triggered something he'd already heard. Right before we uh, sang this song earlier, I would just pray in the Spirit, waiting on the Lord, and the Holy Spirit spoke two things to me very clearly. He said, Roger, you need to know that the enemy is sending hordes to reinforce the religious in your city. But I'm releasing legions of angels to deal with he's, what he's trying to do. And then the second thing, and I knew nothing about the lightning strike. The Lord said, tell the people that I am sending thunder and lightning to their mouth to put it on their tongue. So I believe he was just reinforcing for us. You know, we're, we're stepping into something, and I thought it was interesting because of us talking about boldness. I'm sorry, I, I've been shaking inside ever since all this started this morning. I just know, as you know, we're, uh, there's something big going on with this, and I, I just want to have the anticipation of whatever that thunder and lightning is supposed to do. I, I've, I'm excited about it, because I'm, I'm like you. I haven't always been the boldest character in the world, whether people think it or not. But I'm gonna tell you, if he puts thunder and lightning on your tongue, you're going to shake some things you weren't expecting to shake. Amen. Here's his body. That what he died for so that we'd have this boldness. So we thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. That he would die on this cross for us to receive this. And we receive the impartation of his body into ours. The same boldness that Jesus had, we want. And Lord, supernatural grace to face any crises, any situation, we take this bread in in remembrance of you. And then we take this cup of the shed blood, the power of the resurrection. And we thank you for the blood which represented right here. And we receive the power that comes from it. We plead the blood of Jesus over everything we're fighting for. And we take it into ourselves in Jesus' name. So there's going to be some healing here right now. I feel like God's going to get some healing. We're going to pray and close the meeting. But I want to say this. I had, I had a dream last week. And in the dream, the Lord spoke to me audibly, and he said, you're going to, because of the present darkness that's coming against the church, I need to take my supernatural healing to the next level. That's what he said to me in the dream. I said, okay, Lord, you know, I get excited that part. But then he puts me in front of, a, 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 it's actually somebody I know, but I don't want, it's irrelevant for you. Their name's David. And he put me in front of them, and I, they're starting to speak, and their speech starts being slurred, and it gets worse. And I said, oh, no, they're having a stroke. And the Lord said, I told you my supernatural must go to the next level. And so I ran and put my hand on his chest. And I rebuked it. I pled the blood of Jesus. I said, you will stop right now. And when I prayed for him in the dream, the stroke stopped. And there was no repercussion. In other words, he had no symptoms of it after I prayed for him. And I said, the Lord said, that's what I'm talking about. That you'll have that authority to pray and stop the plan of the enemy. So I didn't pray for a healing. I rebuked the enemy that was taking somebody's 
uh, purpose away from them. And that's what the God, I think even David, it has to do with David's tabernacle. It's a whole thing about that being restored right now. The, like David's tabernacle movement has been having like a stroke. And the Lord said, I'm stopping it and healing it and taking it to the next level. I just want you all to receive that here. So there's some healings in the room. Scott had a word of knowledge for shoulders, which is, I need that. I told him, he, I said, just describe what I need healing for. And then the right eye. So if you need that, we want to pray for you up here for supernatural healing this morning. You got any other words of knowledge, John? Okay, so let me pray for the boldness. Father, in Jesus' name, just like they prayed, Lord, consider their threats. Lord, that they have been made against us as a people, as a church. Consider the threats of society. And Lord, we ask you now to impart to us confidence and boldness. And Lord, just like you shook this property this week, shake us all again to the place that we know that we're being re-infilled with the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, for another outpouring of the Holy Spirit on our lives. So much so that, Father, we get re-baptized again. Father, I want to say, I want to say this because it's prophetic. John doesn't know this, but uh, well, he may know this. That hut that it, it used to be where the Garden Park nursing home was, where we had the Royal Rangers, and he got baptized in the Holy Spirit there. That's we actually moved that, and that's his house he lives in now. We remodeled it and moved it, so it's a picture. And that, that house got shaken this week. So I think it's a picture that we're revisiting this outpouring. Father, I thank you right now that you touched this house and these people. If you need the Lord Jesus Christ today, yeah. I'm telling you, if there's somebody here and you've never given your life to Jesus, this is the day to do it. We don't just say this stuff, folks. We believe this stuff. And you can have life in abundance. It won't be easy. You'll get rejected, but you tell you what? you'll be able to have something inside you to handle the rejection. And you need Jesus. We want to offer him to you today. This is a day of salvation. Come to us. We'll pray with you. So, Father, I release the house because we sing this song. I release this house to new boldness. And, Lord, and I pray for this meeting Friday, Lord, as we go, that we'll crack the dome. And, Lord, we'll see the things of the Spirit and begin to break this thing over our city. In Jesus' name. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Say, I'm getting breakthrough this week. Tell them that right now. And then we're going to pray for those of six. God, if you'll come, we're going to pray for you. If you need to come to the Lord Jesus, come here right now. And we're going to give you that prayer. Yes.